prevented uh, this thing from um, uh, from spreading rapidly again. So, so how do we each feel? I'll just go around the horn. How do we each feel about the COVID-19 end game? When will we see all schools open, all NBA arenas open with no distancing? Give us a quarter in 2021 when in America, enough vaccines will have been delivered and distributed and rapid testing that life goes back to, let's call it 85% of normal. Yeah, I don't think you ever get there. I mean, it's like, uh, we talked about this a couple episodes ago, but it's after 9-11, you know, the TSA emerged and American travel never went back to the way it was before. Um, and I think there'll be a lot about the way we live that's going to be, you know, kind of permanently scarred and permanently changed here for a while, whether it is taking people's temperatures at football games, uh, wearing masks and, you know, farmers markets, who knows, there's going to be all these weird rules are going to pop up, they're going to last for years, regardless of how much uh, um, immunization takes place, regardless of how cheap and available testing is. Uh, we're going to have this scar for a long time um, in terms of how we live as a society. I don't think we should kid ourselves that we're going to go back to quote unquote normal. Um, and I do think kids are going to get tested and schools are going to be like this friggin, you know, almost like TSAs now, uh, you know, kids are going to go into school and get tested regularly and they're going to do all sorts of stuff that we would have never dreamed imaginable in a, in a free country a year ago. Um, and I think that's permanent. Um, I think, you know, we're going to, you're already seeing people going nuts at bars and restaurants and people that have had it are out there partying and living their life again. Um, so there's certainly wait, wait, a lot Don't of, you a think if you get the vaccine, you're just going to be like, YOLO, I've had enough of this? Yeah, but I don't think that, that systems are going to change uh, back to normal. I think systems have changed to the point that we've now got a way of living that we think is safer, that we think is, we, we, we are now kind of inhibited because of the system. Shamaf, you agree? Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a lot fewer, it's what Dave Chappelle said on Saturday, there'll be a lot fewer mass shootings. The pandemic has done a great job of keeping the whites at home. So I think that, <laughs> I we mean, watched it together. All you, all you fucking Three out whites, of four besties watched it together. <laughs> all, you, all you guys got on your mass shooting rampages, you know, the whites are at home. They're frustrated, but they're at home. Thank God. Uh, so I yeah. think there'll be some advantages. Well, I mean, but let's talk about it, Chamath. Does, does 2021 mean kids no. go back to school in 2021 I, September? No problem. No, I think Friedberger's right. I think that the best we'll get back to is sort of this 80% state. And I don't think it happens until probably 2022 and maybe 2023, but probably 2022. Because you have to remember, like, we have to ramp up now billions of vaccine production. Like, it's a, this is a non-trivial path from here to, quote unquote, mass market. And uh, that takes a long time. I think we have to figure out how we're going to administer it. By the way, it's and, and the way that the Pfizer vaccine works and maybe these other folks is you get the shot and then, you know, three months, three weeks later, I think you get a booster. So you have to take two cycles of this thing. Um, and it's not so, going to last forever. And it's not going to last forever. So this is, uh, Freeberg's right. It's the beginning of a very different way of living. Um, I think I think that the, the good part about it is that... Um, you know, we've made a lot of changes that makes our lives a lot more efficient. The bad part about it is we're even more detached from our neighbors. And, you know, we're probably even more likely uh, to be a little bit uh, more separated if we don't make an effort to be together. Sax, do you buy this? Because I get the sense that you might be more optimistic than Freeberg. Yeah, and Ch Ch Chimak. I guess I guess I am. I think COVID is going to be a distant memory by next summer. I think we'll have one to two quarters of transition, but I think that once the vaccine's widely available, plus the treatment and the testings um, for the people who slip through the cracks, um, yeah, I, I tend to think things are going to snap back very fast and COVID will just be this bad memory, a very distant bad memory. And I think, in fact, I think things may bounce back the other way. Um, everyone having been cooped up and afraid of getting some life-threatening illness are going to come out of this really wanting to party i think the whole world's going to be like tel aviv for you know a few months or something <laughs> and um yeah i mean i really do think it's going to bounce back i think to the point politically where a few years from now people could ask wait what why why was it again that trump lost you know um you know th this covid thing will be it will be so in the rearview mirror that we'll wonder why we were so afraid of it i think this is uh i'm going to go with david's Sachs's position here because 
of the simple fact that we had 130,000 confirmed cases, you know, up until this election period, the last week or so, and deaths still not spiking. It's a little, just a ma minor uptick. You know, we had a day with like, uh, I think maybe 1500, but still staying in that, you know, thousand range, even with cases spiking. And I think that we were so incompetent with test and trace in this country that we didn't see exactly what happens in an authoritarian country or a country that is lucky enough to be an island and has easy borders, which we almost do. I mean, we basically have two borders. We're, we're like two thirds of two, you know, 50% island, but Hawaii, Taiwan, Japan, and Australia all quarantined people on the way in. They tested them and they had extremely, extremely low death counts and extremely low case counts with the vaccine being half as effective as, you know, uh, they claim and rapid testing, which some of us have, uh, no, some of us know people who have experienced rapid testing at homes. That combination, I believe, is going to make this go so low. And the people who are high risk are still going to be scared staying home. I think like David, come the summer of next summer, people are going to be at a rave with Freeberg's, you know, custom made Molly or whatever he's making during this downtime <laughs> going absolutely bonkers. I think Burning Man next year becomes like the, the, the greatest Burning Man ever. It'll be, it'll be the burn of, of, of all burns. Why was, let's shift a bit over to uh, the economy. What a rip. Did we see when that Pfizer, I mean, the election and Pfizer this week led to a huge rip? Obviously, there's a little bit of cyclical uh, movement. The tech stocks were the big winners. Now people are starting to buy Disney back up to 140. I guess people assume the parks will reopen. What's our outlook for the stock market in David Sachs's, you know, scenario three? You know, I don't want to say gridlock government, but mm -hmm. forced to compromise government. What do we think the markets look like the next two years? I think you have to go ahead, Saxy Boo. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to say gridlock is great for the markets, um, but both when uh, Bill Clinton was president with a Republican House and when Obama was president and there was a Republican House and I guess uh, Senate for a, a period of time. Uh, gridlock is great for uh, the markets, especially given the amount of stimulus that's taken place. I mean, you had the Trump tax cuts, especially those corporate tax cuts, really set the market on fire. And then you've got this pumping by the Fed and the Treasury, all the stimulus money for COVID. I mean, those conditions. And then, you know, why the, the, is gridlock good? I, we didn't explain that here. Well, because, Explain because to somebody it, who doesn't understand why gridlock is good, why gridlock is good. Well, because it creates predictability for business and it means that Washington's not going to get in the way and do something to screw up the good times. I mean, we have fundamentally, you know, great underlying conditions for economic growth, which is we have now pretty low taxes and we had this for better or worse. We had this tremendous amount of uh, stimulus, fiscal Here's, stimulus. What we know historically is over the past hundred years, right, since the 20s, Independent of Republican administrations or Democratic administrations, you know, more progressive, less progressive, more conservative, less conservative during world wars, not during world wars. Uh, the markets go up 8% a year. So the do no harm solution is that things inflate naturally by 8%, especially if those things are public stocks. So, you know, the markets love the fact that there's uh, nothing that could theoretically get in the way of that natural 8%. And then when you layer on top of it, as David said, uh, all this free money that's just like rocket fuel, jet fuel. Um, but you know, but you saw though that there was a, a rotation, right? There was a rotation out of these high growth software names, particularly the work from home bid kind of got crushed. You know, I mean, I think Zoom was off. 25% over two days or some crazy thing like that. Um, meanwhile, sort of all of these theme park stocks and cruise lines and airlines all of a sudden ripped. So, I mean, look, the reality is the scary thing about all of this is if any of that stuff actually comes to pass, we're going to see inflation. And the reason is because if you start going out and spending a bunch of money on tickets and vacations and flights and this and that and pumping money into the economy and taking all that stimulus money and putting it back to work, prices will go up. 
Um, and by the way, that's not such a bad thing for the economy, which, which needs a little bit of it. So, um, all of this is, I think, generally very, very good news. Friedberg, do you have a position on what you think will happen in the coming? Let's let I, I would think the midterm is what people care most about. So that would be, let's call it two to six quarters. Six there's, there's, to there's, one, there's one potential speed bump still, which is what I mentioned at the beginning, which is Georgia. Uh, the, the Democrats could still win both runoffs in Georgia for Senate. And they could... Um, because Kamala Harris would then have the breaking vote. It would be a 50 Republican, 50 Democrat Senate, and, and the uh, vice president would, uh, would, would break any ties. The question is, if you have that same turnout, where do the libertarians break? Because I think the libertarians were almost 2% of the vote. Well, I think, yeah, what's interesting is, um, the I don't know if you guys have, but I've gotten emails from a lot of people <laughs> asking me to donate money for this uh, uh, runoff campaign in Georgia. Oh I think my we're- Oh God, I got I think, so many, so many I think, VCs I, I, I think, I think we're, so I think we're gonna see these. literally the biggest, um, the, the biggest funding for a Senate runoff race in history by far. Don't you think, Sachs? Like probably north of $100 million being spent, maybe 100 to $200 million being spent on advertisements in Georgia to try and get people to go vote one way or the other. The Democrats think they have a real run at this. They think it's make or break, two years to kind of get their- you know, um, uh, history changing policies in effect. Republicans think it saved the, the nation time. So everyone's rushing to Georgia right now. Um, so the markets are going to have a very close 